Hello everybody, welcome to Percussion Axiom TV. I am your host Tom Burrett and this is episode number 87 and we finally today get to the rest of this SARI development section. If you've been following us from the beginning, you know that we're in the middle of the, the longest series I've done on uh, one single topic. In one week, pretty much from the hour, I'll be performing John Sari's Night Rhapsody at PASIC 2011 in Indianapolis. Can't believe it's so close, it's right around the corner. Very excited, of course, just to see the whole thing. Looking forward to catching up with friends and colleagues and hopefully many of you guys as well. Uh, we're going to spend maybe a quicker show today, uh, one more show after this to finish off the series. Um, today's axiom has to do with two things uh, that you have to have to play John Series Night Rhapsody. Strength, number one. Very, very important. I've done shows on this concept before. And to clarify what I mean by that is just, you know... <clears throat> Have we put the workout in for our hands? Have we developed calluses? Have we developed strength in the out, outer parts of our hand, all the way up here um, in these non-supportive or only supportive digits, right? Fingers uh, four and five that really are just sort of um, not primary digits, but they help the primary digits. So, of course, with Steven's group, we have to um, give them a primary function. So have we put the strengthening in to, um, to uh, develop enough strength to get through these next two sections? especially the first one that we're going to deal with. Um, if you want more information on how to do that, you can go back to sort of the first 10 episodes or so. I talk a lot about that. And I think there's a show entitled Strength and Honor. You can go play on the, the famous um, Gladiator uh, quote. You can go there and check out that for more information on how to do that. But, but strength is um, obviously important for this whole piece being so choppy and so technically oriented that you've got to have the strength to get through it. And so part of this experience for me has been building up that strength, um, which takes quite a long time, actually. Um, a good four weeks at least to be ready for this type of performance. Um, so that's the first part. And then the second thing we're going to talk about are roles. Uh, we've also addressed this on the show. I think it's episode 20, 16 through 20, something like that. Um, and we'll go through it just very briefly, because the second section we're going to talk about is a chorale. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So at the end of today's show, we'll have the... the, the Huge development section here, pretty much finished, and we'll do one more show, since we're so close to the convention, to tie things up. We'll talk about transitions, which is a huge, uh, important aspect of this piece. So we left off um, in measure, or right about measure 182, and beginning at 182, we've got, um, we've talked a lot about this uh, three uh, rhythmic motive idea. We've got that in the left hand. Um, right at a downbeat, and then in the top hand we've got this killer sort of unusual, it's unusual to see an ostinato way up in this register, but, but Sarah gives us this really long, very repetitive ostinato here. Kind of going back and forth between uh, compound meter 6-8 and 3-4. Uh, um, and so we see the significance of the three here. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. That, of course, is the A theme transpose uh, in the right hand there, so he's getting that material. Then in the top hand, this one, four, five, six, this alternation of, of three and two, okay, that we see throughout the work as well. And all of that in D minor-ish, which is, of course, the primary um, tonal center for the work. So we've got that forever, seemingly, in the right hand. And in the left hand, we've got um, several quotations of three, one, uh, two, three, uh, and then a very long um, one-handed roll at the bottom, giving us sort of a melodic um, idea here. So the melody is actually kind of way down here in the left hand. And so uh, thematically, we're getting that mostly from the Dia Siri theme and probably a little bit from the A theme, this idea of... Um, um, dee, dum, so this seemingly goes on forever. I'm not going to play the whole thing for you, um, but uh, two or three times through the whole cycle with left hand rolls and this ostinato going over the top. So we make the transition then into the chorale section, which follows this big section here with uh, three um, G sharps in the left hand. I go ahead and take a couple things down. We haven't talked about that too much in, in this series of episodes. I'm taking some things down since Siri really only had use of low A back in the 70s when he wrote this. Um, and uh, I've taken the liberty just a few times to do that because I, I'm really positive he would have taken advantage of some of those things. 
So maybe we can talk about that a little bit in the last episode more. But so we get the transition of these threes into the corral section. So um, obviously, to play this huge section here, we've got to have tons and tons of strength. If you work mainly on this exercise from my exercise sheet. That's sort of the beginning of that, and being able to just really kind of hang this up here and, and be able to move freely with different roll speeds and moving around in the left hand. So strength is the key there. All right, now we're going to talk about more uh, rolls more specifically into this next section. We get the same melodic um, idea that we had in the left hand. In the left hand, we get in the chorale section, starting in, I believe, it's 255. Uh, let's see, we have up here, and then we get this. So the issue here is to make sure we can hear the, the, top, the top line, and, and to help bring that out, I've got an LS10 here in my top mallet, two LS5s, and a one in the bottom. Um, that really helps kind of the texture here. We've got some issues with this very, being a very resonant part of the instrument, with this being a very sort of less resonant part of the, of the instrument. So we've got a little harder mallet to bring out the melody and to help counteract the natural ring tone of the instrument, which sort of dissipates as we get towards the top here. All right, so during this chorale, we're doing a lot of different things. Let's just talk specifically about the rolls. I use a lot of different roll types. I'm constantly going back and forth between um, traditional roll type, or I call my burret roll, which is sort of a hybrid, ripple, and uh, traditional roll, so kind of rippling the left, in sort of a triplet figure, if you will. And then a full bone ripple roll, 4 3 one, two. Sections is kind of go in between those two transition back and forth. And I'll transition using the burrow roll into a full ripple and back to a traditional, and I can also flam into it. So slightly open each hand slightly until we get into a ripple. So I don't really have any specific method on when I actually switch all those and change and transition from one to the other. Um, I think it's different each time I play it, and so the music dictates in how I do that. But the end goal is that um, we try to limit the regularity of the stroke so your ear doesn't latch on to uh, any specific um, beating pattern or rhythm. So that's the idea behind using these multiple roll types. Again, if you want to go back to, I think it's uh, show 17 through 20 for more info on that, you can. Um, so aside from the different mallet choices here, in this section I'm also really concerned with... Um, Voicing, so I'm bringing out moving lines that are on the inside along with the melody. And so hopefully you'll notice that when I run through this section here in a minute. Uh, this is also a critical moment in the piece. We're getting towards the tail end of a very elaborate, like we've talked about, long developmental section. And it's the first time the piece really settles down a bit. So I'm trying, as, a, as, an, as an interpreter of music, I'm trying to latch on to that as much as possible to help bring things back quite a bit. Um, before the final push and the final transition into the, the recap, recapitulation and the finale of the piece, which we will get to in the next episode. So, um, I think that's it mostly. So, I'll go ahead and play through these sections for you so you can see what I'm getting at, and then we'll tie up the show. Oh, and I should talk about my mallet changes. You'll notice um, that there actually is not really any white space or rests for me to really change mallets, but I've wanted so bad in this corral to get some softer mallets that I've sort of thought creatively, I think, on how to solve the problem of mallet changes. So um, I will show you what that looks like when I play it, I guess, so you'll see. All right, so we need to do this first. So here's these two sections, beginning at measure 182.
and that starts the transition into the recap, which we will start with next time. So hopefully you're able to see what I talked about. Uh, even now, my hands are uh, getting tired from from just just the the strength that's required to sort of pull that off and the control. Um, and you can also see, I hope, the different voice leading things we're dealing with, the mallet choices and the mallet switches, and hopefully how that sort of brings contrast to the piece and lets it settle a bit before we get back to the raucous ending. So that's today's episode, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope this has been uh, helpful for you. Today's question really has mostly to do with uh, some feedback. I'd love to get some feedback from you guys on uh, if this is interesting to you even, if, there's, uh, if, this is gonna, if, you, if you feel like this is helping your understanding of the piece. Um, let's just love to hear from you. I'm getting some, some comments, which is great, for, from some of you that, are, that seem to be getting a lot out of it, and that's really encouraging. Um, but it's hard, to, it's hard to do these shows and not know who's watching or who's learning. And I just love some feedback, so if you've got that, great. Before we get to the last episode, I'd love to get that. So we are one week away. I can't wait to see a lot of you, I hope, at PASIC. I'll be at the Maltech booth for an artist signing Saturday at 10 o'clock, I believe. Um, I'll be paying close attention, of course, to Twitter. Um, if you look at PASIC, uh, use the hashtag pound PASIC11, PASIC11 um, is, I think, the official PAS um, hashtag. So great. Thank you guys so much. That's today's show, and I'll see you next time.